but I can I can stop sharing. That would be awesome if you don't mind. Looks like everybody's coming in now. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. All right. Well, I guess we'll get started here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first session workshop and uh, today's uh, uh, first day of our conference. Uh, the workshop is entitled ETD Accessibility defined, designed, reviewed, and refined. Um, sharing this information with you is going to be Terry Green from the University of Toledo College of Graduate Studies, Kim Flashman, Bowling Green State University's Graduate College, um, and Allison Thompson from ProQuest. Uh, my name is John Fredrome, the repository librarian at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'll be your moderator for the next 100 or so, 120 or so minutes. Um, and a quick reminder that before we begin, during the presentation portion, please keep your audio and video muted. You can use the chat tab to ask questions, which will then be addressed during the question and answer portion of the workshop. So please make sure to mute your audio and video unless and, and uh, turn off the video unless you are presenting or asked to participate. So thank you for joining us, uh, Terry, Kim and Allison. I'll hand things over to you and please be sure to try reserve some time for questions uh, and or a discussion at the end. And I'll try to make sure I, I reach out within five minutes of the end of the session just to make sure we're within time. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. Um, first of all, I just want to let everybody know um, I am, for some reason, my husband, David, has hijacked my Zoom account. So I am here. I am not David. Um, I am also not a cat, if any of you get that reference from during the COVID years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, my presentation. Um, and again, this is a workshop. And so there will be some, you know, covering of, you know, different concepts and philosophies, maybe defining things at the beginning, and then getting input as we look to the future. And right in the middle of it, um, Kimberly and I will go ahead and run us through what it looks like to create accessibility in a Word document and a PDF. So, <clears throat> Um, we will also be asking, reaching back out and asking for input throughout. Um, but of course, uh, we hope we have two hours. So there should be ample time for questions and conversations and w whatever it is that you want to know more about. Um, so without further ado, let me. Here we are. OK. All right. So hopefully everybody can see um, the title screen, ETD Accessibility, Defined, Design, Reviewed, and Refined. Um, I really wanted to just leave it as ETD Workshop, <laughs> um, but I was trying to be clever um, because I think we all go through different stages, you know, as we are um, approaching this. I would also like to point out that um, my uh, Presentation also has alt text, as you probably saw that popping up. Um, so I'm Terry Green. I am with the University of Toledo. I have been with their graduate college since 2010. Um, and my role has evolved from ETD specialist to now director of academic and student affairs. Um, but the ETD portion has been thrown back on my lap. Um, but I'm also the ADA liaison and diversity liaison um, to the university for the College of Graduate Studies. So accessibility is part and parcel, right, of, of diversity, of inclusion. And that is the spirit with which I have put some information, you know, in this workshop. Um, and I will let my partner in crime introduce herself, Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Fleshman, and I have been handling theses and dissertations since 2013. And Terry was kind enough to kind of guide me along to help kind of revamp how it was done at BGSU. Um, so I work in our graduate college and also handle our website and uh, social media. So accessibility is big to me. I have an IT background. So I've become a copy editor kind of evolved. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. And then we're joined by um, one of our, our primary sponsor, um, ProQuest Clarivate. So Allison, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Allison Thompson. I am a product manager at ProQuest for Graduate Solutions. So my products include ETD Administrator and um, the Dissertations Dashboard. And I'm really, really interested in the topic of accessibility been talking to a lot of you and trying to understand more. So very excited to be participating today. Thank you so much. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dig in. All right, so what we're gonna be covering today as implied by the title, defined. What does accessibility mean in the context of ETDs? I am gonna go a little bit uh, large view, aerial view, um, and then we'll focus back in on the uh, con concept of document accessibility. Designed, how do we build accessibility into the writing of an ETD so that we're not all stuck trying to remediate documents and really not being able to adequately put them in the proper shape that they should be? Reviewed. Um, so I'm assuming if you're joining us that you have in some form or fashion, you know, um, part of your job is to either educate, train, inform, review, um, you know, publish, um, remediate different, you know, ETD documents. Um, and so how do we do that? Right. How do we check? How do we find and fix non-accessible components of an ETD? Um, this is also related to website design, document design, um, but we're going to be focused in on the use of, of Adobe for PDFs. Refined. What do we need to know, right, to improve on the basic principles and best practices? Many of us already have kind of a cobbled together toolkit. Um, some of us are very lucky to be at institutions who've really put a lot of thought uh, behind digital accessibility, um, and they have entire offices devoted to that and staff, and um, I don't know that that is necessarily common amongst all of us. Um, so, you know, where do we find this information? Um, how can we improve on what's already in place? And then we're looking forward, right? So we're going to be talking about which resources are the most robust that will help us. Um, who are our people, right? Where are the communities of practice where we can get together? Um, good news, uh, there are already several in place, including right with the US ETDA. So, um, and then the last part of that is always be learning, right? Um, we may have to design something ourselves. We may have to seek out and be proactive to assemble these communities to get the training. So we'll be talking about these things. Um, and you'll see here, um, I went ahead, I was looking for an image, right? And so the title of this side, slide is course outline. So I went to Google and I just typed in outline and then looked through the images. And I found this, these pair of glasses and it's an outline, right? So it's not filled in or anything. Um, and so when we talk about alt text, right, we are also talking about making meaning out of non-text elements um, so that they are easily percepted and understood, um, you know, by, by your reader. Um, so here I've just, I've defined, I, I could have just said eyeglasses. I could have just said an outline because that's what I Googled. Um, but this is a front view outlined illustration of eyeglasses. And um, I don't know, I just thought it was just an interesting concept. Also, I wear glasses. I have like four frames. I love them all. And also we're looking to the future, right? So let's get on our rose colored glasses and move forward. All right, defined. What does accessibility mean in the context of ETDs? It's really, it's about people. It's about compliance and usability. It's about context. Um, and also our Clarivate's quest to achieve accessibility as well. So people. So really what accessibility is, it's it's a practice, right? It's it's something that's purposeful that you do. It's it's making information, activities, or environments sensible, meaningful, and usable 
for as many people as possible. Um, when we say something is accessible, and this definition I took right off of the ADA.gov website, it refers to a site, facility, work environment, service, or program that's easy to approach, uh, enter, operate, participate in, and or use safely and with dignity by a person with a disability. So when we think about accessible documents, oftentimes we automatically go to a person with a disability who has to use adaptive technology to access the information. So primarily we, we tend, our default is like to think of low vision or blind, right? But an accessibility user is anyone whose access to the information, activities, or environments are impeded, okay? They are blocked. There's a mismatch going on. Um, and they, it can be temporary, it could be recurring or situational, or it could be a permanent condition. And so when we expand our concept of what accessibility is and, and how people use, you know, products and services and read documents, right? They include things like cognitive, you know, physical mobility, auditory, verbal, ocular, vision, but they can also include things like age or language, education, um, technological aptitude, and just sheer access, right? If someone can't afford to buy, you know, um, an electric wheelchair, right? Um, if someone does not have, um, you know, a screen reader um, downloaded, you know, maybe they're just using everything with a phone even. So when we think about those things, that informs what kind of fixes we make um, to these documents. And so when we think about that, you know, we think about like, what is the purpose, right, of the author of the ETD? I'd welcome anybody to enter into the chat right now what you think the purpose of the author of the ETD is. What is their purpose for, for writing and, and sending this out? And second to that, what is the goal of the reader or the user, right, of the ETD? So I don't know, John, if anything's coming in through the chat yet. Not quite yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, you know, we can return to those also, or just as they come to you, just again, enter them in the chat. Um, I want people to be thinking, right? Um, and then the third question is, who's responsible for lowering these barriers, right? Whether it's a barrier of, of access, a barrier of design, um, a barrier of um, even lack of staff to make fixes, for example. Who is responsible for, for lowering those barriers? Um, I would suggest that it's everyone's responsibility, um, but in, in different levels, right? And in different ways. And so I think probably many of ETD practitioners, um, you know, it's their responsibility because it's part of their job. It was assigned to them and or they may have already have a passion for design or, you know, um, they're technologically savvy. Um, these things may have grown, you know, they may have learned along the way. Um, and so it's okay to not lead the charge, right? Um, but everyone needs to shoulder some of this responsibility. Um, and so, I think it's just helpful, uh, given some of the feedback and the previous conversations that have surrounded, you know, this issue, right, um, is where do I fit in? How much do I need to know? How much do I need to do? Is it ever going to be good enough? Right. And so um, if we're having those questions, then certainly, you know, our institutions may be having those questions, faculty and students may be having those questions. So, um, you know, again, this is not the hands-on part of it. This is more of a kind of a broader view of philosophical underpinning, if you will. 
So, so we do the, have several yeah. things in the chat here, Terry. Oh, oh good. I was just going to yeah. start sharing with you, Terry. Yeah, there was quite a few about disseminating and sharing scholarship oh, yeah. and their I'd creativity. Love to hear it. Yes. Um, there are some of the to get their information to the public and sharing their research. Um, there are some to what well, was it, just to graduate, which I thought I appreciate. There's a lot of, that's on the students' minds for sure. <laughs> so yes. they, they, making it easier for them helps them graduate. Um, and basically writing and sharing their research and future research and and uh, disseminating their 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 work from the university. Um, I'm trying to see the advisor's responsibility to review content, but uploader's responsibility to make sure it's findable uh, and other back end things in that regard. So yes, that's that is true. Um, the author roles to share their understanding of the topic of the ETD and then to engage with their scholarly co uh, colleagues. So yes, starting out the scholarly communication uh, role. Um, and the role of the author is to expand a knowledge base through scholarly evidence based research while making it accessible. Uh, and the reader's role to gather information to get to learn more about the topic in the ETD and then further, further engage with the scholars in their area. Um, and the goal of the reader was to did the student learn enough about the research writing uh, the topic and communicate that well. So quite a few good good points there. We'll to make sure we compile these and have them for, for viewing later. I think you're still muted there, Terry. Okay, yes, I am. <laughs> Not anymore. Thank you everyone for your for your input um, and, and John for uh, monitoring that and, and getting that all together so to preserve that. Um, so when we move on from accessibility is about people, we also talk about frameworks, right, with which to view accessibility. And probably the two that are the most helpful perhaps when we're asking those questions of what do I have to do? What should I do? What can I do? How do I do it? Who can help me? Um, what is the standard? Um, so we can think about that in terms of compliance and usability, right? So when we talk about compliance, we're talking about, you know, um, it's like section 508 or WCAG, for example. And, um, and, and those have very well-defined standards and levels of accessibility. Um, and, but it can be intimidating, right, to go onto the WCAG site and, and look through and try and decipher, you know, well, am I, you know, A compliance? Am I triple A compliance? Um, you know, is this um, for whatever purpose? Um, but if we understand the basic tenets of that compliance and that compliance is often built into, you know, your universities, for example, or governments, um, government websites, for example, it's built in as a standard or, you know, even, you know, these are the standards we have to meet to be in compliance, to be, um, you know, to be legal. Um, and, so, but that is a kind of a shifting boundary right there there isn't just one size fits all hard and fast rules um you know i mean there are hard and fast rules but they don't necessarily apply in every situation or for every context and so we talk about usability right so compliance doesn't necessarily mean that it's usable and i discovered this when i fell down the rabbit hole of color contrast and the use of color that is accessible um and it's a rabbit hole, but it's fascinating. And I learned about things like luminance and vibration of colors. And so what may technically be a, a good ratio of contrast, you know, uh, blue on white or, or uh, white on black, for example, it may be, if, if it's a particular color that has a high vibration, it can appear, you know, it can pass the test but it can appear to just the average user to, you know, it would, it would mesh with your eyes. You know, you wouldn't be able to really clearly distinguish, you know, sharp outlines. Um, so just because it's compliant doesn't necessarily mean that it's usable by as many people as possible. Um, and not everybody is using, for example, a screen reader, right? So we're also, when we're talking about usability we're talking about i have practically trifocals at this point and i'm in front of a screen 
Uh, is my screen too bright? Is, is there glare? Am I having trouble seeing? Um, my eyes don't bounce back and forth anymore like they used to because I'm approaching 60 years old. So um, I don't have that same physical capacity to apprehend and comprehend, you know, the printed word in, in the same way I was, I did when I was 30. So there is no such thing though as 100% accessibility. And I say that because, and this is somewhat anecdotal, but when I first started as an ETD specialist, this was all very new to me. And in terms of like formatting and reviewing, and I was a perfectionist, detail oriented, and it took months <laughs> to like, pull myself out of that and understand that perfection is not achievable. Um, that, you know, it, it really, at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't matter if your, if your copyright page is supposed to not have a page number, but it does, you know, a, a worse problem is that there are no page numbers, right? And so I think um, many of us who work in that in this realm um, have this need to fix things and make things right and make things perfect if you will um, and you'll never achieve that <laughs> and so I think kind of stepping back and looking at you know easier pathways right um, and and that's what I'm going to talk about next Context, right? Let's let's put it all let's put it all into in the right context. So, if if a document's accessibility is so varied, right? Someone's using a screen reader. Someone has you know triple bifocal. You know, someone else is um, you know maybe they um, have uh, dexterity or mobility issues, and they have to use their eyes, you know, to move a cursor all these all these different ways of interacting and so how do you create that document that meets the needs that that allows all these different types of access to occur um basically you need to approach it as accessible in context right so you're going to apply design decisions that are responsive to the document's intended user right and the conditions of inaccess that they face so if one issue is um you know there are people that are going to be using screen readers then you focus on things like you know heading levels and bookmarks and proper tagging um if you have someone who uh may have dyslexia well, then maybe you look at what kind of font is being used. Um, years ago, I received a dissertation written in Comic Sans, and I made a huge joke out of it. Like, I was like, what, what is going on, right? It didn't look important and stately, and it wasn't in Times New Roman. Well, I have subsequently found out that Comic Sans... Um, in addition to a few other specialty fonts, is actually very, very readable by users with dyslexia. And it's because of the individual unique shape of each character. Um, and so it's about just talking about and, and deciding what is more important, the look of something, or we've always done it that way, or, hey, we could have someone with dyslexia who really needs to know more, you know, about this research. And if you're going to throw up these barriers, you know, um, that don't need to be there, then maybe the research gets overlooked, right? And again, it's about offering the opportunity to as wide a group of people as possible to, you know, use and understand, um, you know, what they're interacting with. So, you know, if, if really, if you can ensure that the file does not break any of the stated compliance rules for that document type, and then you can also, you know, um, think about the design of it in the first place, 
um, to avoid having to remediate, then really that's a great framework to work within, right? Um, and it's really, it's, you know, in prior discussions, um, like with the Ohio Link Group, you know, we've talked about, you know, acting in good faith, right? With In good faith, you are meeting these needs of, you know, opening up the accessibility of a document to as many readers as possible and removing barriers. And some is going to be technological or, you know, like, you know, uh, retagging a document, for example. Others might be more design oriented. So are how is it organized? Is it organized in a way that I could, just as a user without adaptive technology, tap to where I want to go, specifically select a portion of the document that I want to look at? Um, is everything linked together? So my best uh, advice would be to just stay informed on your school standards and guidelines and operate within that and focus on that. Um, so any questions? or comments? There were actually some great comments um, uh, given earlier about some article, the color contrasts and things about that. So there's some links in chat about that as well. And we we're just having a bit of a discussion about sans serif versus serif fonts and mm -hmm. the difference between screen versus print. And those with reading disabilities may have some issues reading serif fonts, which is why open dyslexic is a great font to use. So a lot of interesting things going on in chat. <laughs> Well, I'm really, I'm excited that people are aware of these things and, um, you know, and, and so again, you know, when we're thinking about in our own schools and whomever designed the formatting guidelines, right. Um, and who has the authority to change them, um, you know, those are the types of things that we should also think about, you know. Um, but the but the middle part of this is is going to be focused on kind of the technical issues, right, of Word and, and PDF. But before we get to that, <laughs> um, I'm going to stop sharing and we are going to have Allison uh, join us here. And she has, I guess she has uh, some different slides. So let me see here. How can I? I'm sorry. Talk about technically savvy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you just do the stop share. Here we go. Happen. Yep. I had, it on, go. I had it on my second monitor. So, <laughs> all right. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Can somebody mm -hmm. confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, good morning again, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I do want to just chat for a quick 10 minutes prior to the workshop and then um, revisit a couple topics after. But I think Terry did a really great job of sort of giving some background about digital accessibility. What is it? Um, why is it important? And I would like to sort of piggyback off of that and talk about some of the discovery that we've done here at ProQuest. So really trying to understand, okay, this, this topic has been thrown around. We know that there's um, standards in place, people are doing stuff. What, what is everybody doing? What are institutions and our partners um, and our, our stakeholders and community doing around accessibility and really trying to get a good idea of that? And I think um, it would be helpful uh, to share that with this group. So that's what I plan to do today. Um, the, like Terry mentioned, we've got the, the workshop component in the middle. Um, and then I'd like to share some of the, the things that we've done at ProQuest around developing a community of, of kind of thought leaders and institutional partners in this space and, and considerations for resources and tools for the future. But to jump in, I think most people on this call are pretty familiar with ProQuest, so I'll keep this one brief. Um, but we've, we've been doing this a, lot, a long time. We've got over 80 years in graduate content expertise. Uh, first manuscript was disseminated in 1939, so prior to the E in ETD, right, a long time ago. Uh, we've recently partnered with the Web of Science. So we've expanded our reach from uh, 4 million to over 10 million users with the Web of Science, so a lot of amplification and great exposure for, for authors' work. 
And like all of you, we are navigating this changing landscape of ETDs, right? We're seeing differences in um, file types, uh, non-traditional ETD files, maybe that, that aren't PDFs, um, plagiarism and AI detection, chat GPT, all of that is everywhere. Um, and of course, digital accessibility, what we're gonna talk about today. So we're cognizant uh, that the space is changing and trying to really stay sort of informed about market needs and, and how we can su best support our community. Um, so like Terry said, we've, we've done some good discovery around accessibility and I wanna share some of the outreach that we've done, some of the, the information that, that we've, uh, some of the channels that we've used rather to solicit feedback and some of what we've found. So it was really important to understand with accessibility, um, what is the baseline? What, what are our institutional partners doing? Um, where, where is everybody with this? So we deployed an ETD admin user survey. We got almost 350 responses, which was great. We have an ETD admin user group where we've had this discussion. Uh, we've done some great customer interviews and worked with the Ohio Link organization. Some of the people on this call um, participated in those interviews as well. And this discovery gave us some really interesting and key insights that I wanted to share with you. 82% uh, of our respondents said that digital accessibility is critically or very important at their institutions. So this is a top priority for folks. Um, but at the same time, and maybe some of you on this call can relate to this, um, our respondents felt a lack of guidance around ETDs and accessibility specifically. So maybe they're being told that this is really important. They know that it is. Um, maybe there's some website guidance. We talked about WCAG earlier. Um, but really specifically pertaining to ETDs, there's not much. Um, and respondents did say that they expect future mandates. So a lot of institutions started with websites or digital uh, course materials potentially for accessibility efforts, um, kind of maybe the easier grabs, right? But ETDs and other resources are expected to, to follow in terms of needing to meet these standards set by the institution. One really remarkable piece I thought was that there is a lot of institutional differences in how this is handled. So who, Terry mentioned, who is responsible for removing these barriers? Who's, who's taking the ownership of digital accessibility? And she's absolutely right. It, it should be a collective effort. But what I've seen in our discovery is that it's sort of falling to um, wherever there's space. So maybe that's in IT, maybe that's Office of Accessibility, maybe that's the library. It really varies widely by institution. And typically you're all in higher education, so this likely will not surprise you, um, but there's not a lot of dedicated resources um, in most in instances for digital accessibility. So this work is maybe being added on to the plate of a, a staff member that has another primary responsibility and sort of just being absorbed by whoever has or maybe doesn't have capacity um, to do the work. And finally, we see a big training and equipment gap. So um, we're gonna talk about some resources today. There are things out there, um, but one common denominator that we heard is some of the existing uh, tools have, have cost barriers, they're cost prohibitive, or there's a level of sort of user savviness that they um, you know, really need somebody well-trained and well-versed in digital accessibility um, to get the most out of this tool. And some of the interview takeaways I thought were really um, important and, and things I'd like to share with you. We talked about um, erratic solutions, right? So typically or, or frequently the ETD, uh, writing to review to publication process is really decentralized. And so different processes and kind of capacity constraints means this work will fall to kind of whoever can do it, um, whether that maybe makes the most sense strategically or not. Institutions are finding it's very difficult to um, enforce any kind of student participation. And I get it, right? I mean, these are graduate students. They're under a ton of pressure, they're at a very, very busy time in their career, their academic career. Um, and, and is it the right thing to do to delay graduation or, or put up barriers um, if they can't get there with accessibility standards? Uh, 
Often a lack of expertise came up in these interviews. So folks felt like they were charged with doing this work where maybe they weren't completely qualified or educated in that space. Um, and the threat of lawsuits came up again and again. So when we talk about reasons for doing this work, of course, um, people want to support all different types of learners. It's the right thing to do. Um, the student affairs professionals I spoke with were very, very much in that place. But there was this looming concern of risk to the institution. And as am I, as the person now responsible for digital accessibility, am I doing enough to protect us? And that was um, uh, really a, a heavy weight on some of these folks that I spoke with. And I think this quote really illustrates uh, sort of the, the challenges unique to ETDs and digital accessibility. Um, this individual said, the highly complex and technical writing of many dissertations can make it especially challenging to ensure accessibility. I think anybody on this call that's tried to do this work with an ETD can relate. Uh, even if a staff member can review and flag compliance issues, it's highly burdensome to ask a student author to revise a dissertation that may have many hundreds of pages, complex charts, plots, and graphics. It requires detailed technical and disciplinary knowledge. So not a quick and easy win in, in most instances. And likewise, hearing kind of from some of our content partners, I think this feedback really illustrates the need for um, more research in, in digital accessibility and uh, the opportunity for ProQuest to really provide some partnership and some resources. Um, because you can kind of sense and hear the frustration uh, that, that the folks doing this work are, are feeling. So we have guidelines for accessibility for websites and other platforms. PDFs and ETDs are unique and there's significant barriers to enacting requirements around them. This is something that we hope to do in the future. We did a big push for accessibility compliance. It was thrown at us regular staff, those who have no expertise in web design. Parsing through the web accessibility boot camps they had us attend was incredibly challenging. PDF remediation though was next to impossible and we resorted to removing PDFs entirely. Uh, and lastly, we value accessibility but requiring accessibility and checking for it would add a lot to our workload and slow our turnaround times for approving materials. Many of, many of our students have limited experience with document formatting and may not be able to afford additional software. And so I think uh, you can kind of see that the context here is, we know that this work is important. We know it's valuable. We know it benefits and supports our, our learners with diverse needs, um, but how can we get there? And, and that's um, something I'm gonna talk about a little bit more at the end of the discussion after our workshop. So um, Terry, I will throw it back over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I was just looking here at the chat as well. So um, one user said you won't use PDF in the future. Um, so is that a prediction that we will move away from PDFs entirely or um, is there an alternative? Just curious. Feel free to put your comments, continue to putting your comments in the, um, in the chat. Excuse me, whoops, okay. I almost logged out of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> speaking of things I can't even see on my own large screen. <laughs> okay. So let me go back to sharing my presentation. And I'm going to um, fast forward through, because um, I already had some of the slide, some of uh, Allison's slides already built in. So let me move through that. Okay, so now we get to the start of our more um, nuts and bolts, hands-on, um, and uh, really when I was asked to offer this workshop uh, June 28th, <laughs> um, I immediately turned to Kim to help me with this. Um, she may have come to Toledo for some initial training, but she has a much more robust you know, background in IT and technical writing. And um, she was running a a sort of a, uh, I can't even remember now, Kim, can you describe 
that that lab that you used to run? <laughs> <laughs> so it originally was the Student Technology Center, and then it became the Collab Lab. Um, so we tutored students, faculty, staff when it became the Collab Lab um, on Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and uh, Photoshop, and Design Illustrator, Acrobat. Um, web software, video software, uh, 3D software, um, and several other programs. So. Thank you. Yes. So, you know, the um, master now becomes a student. <laughs> so, um, you know, Kim is going to be, I think, uh, doing the heavier lift as we move into away from Word and, and into PDFs and uh, a little bit more tricky um, solutions. So how do we build accessibility into the writing of an ATD? Well, we need to think about what is your source document? What are you going to author in? Um, do they have built-in tools and are you using them? Do you know that you can use them? Um, did you know that you can check accessibility as you're working? So I think, um, you know, one of the comments earlier remarked on how a student just needs to graduate, right? They, they're doing this because they need their degree. And that's uh, very accurate for many of them. It may not be their sole reason, but they have not prepared all along in terms of being familiar with authoring software, with, you know, um, organizing a document. <clears throat> and so for many, if not most, the formatting, right, is is a is the last flaming hoop that they have to jump through. And so they've already, even if they've used a template, they've probably corrupted it, you know, and, and they have created something that is just kind of a tangled mess. And then so, you know, now with accessibility thrown into the mix, that's just additional undoing of things that could have been done better from the start. And so that's the approach that I think makes the most sense, um, you know, uh, for ETD practitioners um, is to know best practices, to know, you know, um, the, the softwares, uh, you know, the, um, the tools, um, the built-in tools. And, and, and that is something that students and faculty would need to be educated in but it's uh, probably a, a little bit of an easier lift to do that than to, at the very late stage, talk about how do we make this PDF, you know, how do we tag it in the right order and, and all of that. So in the beginning, there was Word, right? So I know there are a lot of different, you know, there's, there's open source programs, there's, you know, Google Docs, um, you know, um, and of course there is Microsoft Office Word, right? Or Word for Microsoft uh, 365. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because it's pretty much broadly accessible through schools, right? Whether it's a free license for like downloading onto devices. I know at UToledo, we can download it. Our students can download it up to onto up to five devices for example, um, or it might be a cloud-based service where they're, you know, um, they access it through, you know, their um, SSO sign-on. Um, it may be um, part of um, machines in computer labs. Um, but the whole point is that it is very widely used and is almost always free to the student. Um, and Microsoft themselves have really made tremendous strides towards improving the accessibility for the user and the product. Um, so it's accompanied by a wealth of best practices, step-by-step -step instructions, and the, those instructions are presented in very easily navigable and understandable formats on their office accessibility website. Um, you can also use the help button, right? Um, and it will take you to, you know, specific tutorials. I find those a little, um, hmm, sometimes they're a little hard to understand. Um, so, um, but again, with having built in, for example, an accessibility wizard, you know, in, in fact, um, in Microsoft 365, 
They also have the editor function and the accessibility wizard, and it will start reformatting for you um, and um, reminding you along the way to put alt text or, you know, how to create tables. So I think it's, it is probably, you know, when we, when we, think, I think about like at Utilito, right, as they're going through website redesign and they keep talking about, you know, single source of truth, right? Well, if, if, if we're working in Word, then we should be using their tools and their guides, you know, and instructions to achieve the results. Um, so I have here a link. I don't know though if it'll open up. You'll have to let me, uh, uh -huh. yes, allow it. Although I don't know if it's gonna show up as being shared. You'll have to stop sharing your, um... PDF and Thank then you. share your <laughs> browser. Yep. Okay. There we go. Okay. So you should be seeing make your Word documents accessible to people with disabilities. Is that? I can't see it. Nope. Okay. Hmm. Well, it says it's being shared. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't click share. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I can see it. <laughs> Okay, Thanks. great. And that's just another little thing, right? The fewer buttons you have to click to accomplish something, that's accessibility, right? I mean, you know, if you've, if you've moved things around and you don't know, you know, where you put them. Um, but anyway, so make your Word documents accessible to people with disabilities. So this is part of their office accessibility, you know, um, I don't want to call it a line, but their 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 division, um, and right here it talks about best practices, how to check your accessibility uh, while you work in Word, um, avoid using tables, use built-in titles, subtitles, and heading styles, um, use alt text for visuals, use accessible font format and color, create accessible lists. I mean. The list goes on, right? And so they give very, they give a, a kind of a checklist so you could kind of do it manually. Um, you could set it right out in the front and be like, I'm this, these are the, these are the five things I'm going to focus on, right? I'm going to focus on document structure, um, headings, um, bookmarks, alt text and tables, right? Um, your your school may be asking for more, um, but this is a very good place to start and will go a long ways towards removing common barriers. Um, so anyway, I will stop sharing that. And I will go back. Okay, there we go. Yay, it worked. Okay. So, um, so for these reasons, this is why I am suggesting that you promote the most accessible, easily, you know, or ubiquitous <laughs> authoring program that you can to your students, whether you're creating templates for them or providing instructions for how they can set up their own document and use the tools. Um, obviously, we'd want to make sure that they do have access to it. But a lot of students, um, they don't really don't necessarily have experience. So um, I received a an ETD um, couple about a month ago, and it was composed in Google Docs, but they did not use Google Doc accessibility tools. And it, it there was no formatting. It was, um, I didn't even know what to do with it. Now, luckily, okay, it was at the format review stage and it was an early one. So I wound up sending her our template, which is a word template, but I also just put her content into the template and sent that to her as well and suggested that she should continue drafting within the template. Um, and it it really, it made a difference, <laughs> you know, her committee was 
amazed that they that now it had structure and it was you know easy to follow um they could identify gaps you know um in the research or how she explained things that they were able to focus in on because they weren't distracted by disorganization and lack of formatting um so in the beginning there was work yes um whoops Okay, so at this point, I am going to share, I'm sorry, I'm going to share a document, and it's a, just a sample document, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, hold on a second, where did my... There we go. Okay. All right. So um, this is a sample thesis, okay? Very minimal. Um, and I, I'm going to kind of scroll through it a little bit. And I would like for folks to put in the chat if they kind of see anything that could possibly be wrong with it, that could potentially not be accessible. And again, this is in the Word version. I'm going to reduce this just a little bit. Okay. All right. Can everybody still see it? Okay, good. We had a couple of responses about the font. Okay, like what? Uh, one person said Sarah font, other person just said font. Um, I'd like to say that there's no styles included on the page other than normal, so bookmarks are probably not gonna be created when converted to a PDF. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got, but we've got everything organized, right? Like we've got page numbers, we've, we've got, you know, section headings. Let me do this. Let me turn on the formatting. So if we look up to the styles, oh, it's just normal, right? It's not any type of heading. It's the same as this paragraph, right? Our um, page numbers. Guess what? They're not actually real page numbers. Someone has gone ahead because they didn't know how to put page numbers in and use, you know, page breaks and section breaks. Um, and so they just typed it, right? And so, so there's that. <laughs> we also had a comment that the, the redundancy of table of contents and the table of contents. We love circular links. Yes, don't we? Um, and so that is courtesy of the University of Toledo's format guidelines, which I did not invent. I attempted to uh, thwart the person responsible. That was in 2011, and it hasn't been changed. So I might have the power now, um, but that's still somewhat in question. But exactly, um, right? So when we talk about what are useful you know, links in a table of contents. How do people use them? Where do they want to go? What do they need to know? Very well seen. Okay. So clearly, Rocky Rocket basically just typed this into a blank Word document, right? Um, did not use any styles, did not use any headings, um, did not use any built-in tools. And so if I am looking here, 
oh, this version I have at home doesn't have the accessibility wizard, but I can go to accessibility checker. Okay, wow. Okay, well, let's take a look here. Missing alt text. So for any who are not familiar, alt text means alternative text. It is a way to um, describe the action or purpose of non-text illustrative material. And it can be fairly simple, like my, you know, image of the eyeglasses, or it could be, you know, um, oh gosh, it could be, you know, a very complex um, chart, for example. Um, so if I click on the picture, it'll take me to what's that question here. Okay, no alt text. So if someone is using a screen reader, it is just going to read and then just skip right over this, okay? And- uh, mm -hmm. Terry, uh, just, we had a question in, in chat I thought might be, what, uh, somebody asked, what do you mean by using styles? So if we could, maybe some people are not familiar with that. Might yes, well. yes, thank you, okay. Let me go back to home. Okay. Styles is a way to identify um, what role or organization this text has. So for example, when we talk about heading levels, right? We want a hierarchical heading level. And so a heading one should be reserved for like the title of your document. Whereas a heading two, for example, would be used repeatedly for every level two heading. So in something like, we'll just pretend that each chapter is its own title, right? Its own discrete unit. So if I wanted this to be um, appear in a table of contents and also be able to be navigated to immediately, I can highlight it and I can click on heading one. Okay, I'm gonna turn this off. You see these little, little arrows there, okay? And so if I click on this, it is now a heading one, it is what it's labeled as. Well, so then we want, so then the next level, right? We have several sections, um, subsections. So, um, and they are, identified with the chapter and then the order of appearance. So we have, for example, the first subsection is permanent disability, section 2.1. I can create a numbering system. I can also go to heading two. And I've already, and if it's something that you, um, if it's something that looks weird, right? Like if I clicked heading three, in fact, that's what I'm going to do with a heading three, which is in, I think it's back in chapter one. There we go. So see how this is chapter one, sec subsection two, the third item, right? So it is, you know, it is a level three. Right, so the titles first, then your subsections, then your sub subsections. You can think of it like an outline, like how we used to do in school. So I'm like, okay, this is a level three. Well, if I go to heading three, well, this is already pre programmed, right? But it doesn't have to stay that way. I can right click and I can update this heading to match the selection, or I can go to modify and put in what I want it to look like. Um, in this case, I, it, is, it looks like what I wanted. It has the font and the size and the boldness and everything that I already want. So in this case, I'm gonna right click and just say update heading three to match selection. This is now heading three. And I can click on that. And since it was already updated, I can just continue assigning that heading level. So um, now, interestingly enough, this accessibility checker doesn't check for the use of headings or styles per se. 
Um, it is identifying, however, missing alt text um, and the lack of a header row for a table. So I'm going to go back to that picture. Okay. All right. So if I right click, and again, depending on what which, which version you know of, of Word you're using, or if you're using it like online in a cloud, you may find these items in different locations. If you can't find them, then do what I did, which is tell me what you want to do. And I put an accessibility checker and it you know popped it right in for me. So if you go down to format picture, you click on this little funny thing, layout and properties you can put in your alt text, okay? Um, and this is new for me. I had never really thought about a title for alt text. And so I, I'm, I hover over the information button um, and it says a title can be read to a person with a disability and it's used to determine whether they wish to hear the description of the content. Similar to a, a, any title that you use for, you know, a paper, um, similar to the function of an abstract, um, similar to what is being listed in a content or table of contents. Um, so, you know, if, if you are not really providing robust titles for like your chapters, for example, or explanatory titles, um, and, and people don't know even what you're going to be talking about, they may just skip right over it. So here, I'm just going to put in um, the title of, and I could just use the, the, the label or the caption, examples of site disabilities. Terry, there was a question earlier that relates to this. That said, could the figure or table captions below the figure or table be substituted for alt text? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Um, the question was, uh, where'd it go? Could the table or figure captions uh, be substituted for alt text? Hmm. <laughs> We've had this question. We've talked about this, like, for example, within our Ohio Link, you know, group. <laughs> um, and really, alt text is meant to convey the purpose or action, right? Like, why are you using this image? Um, and so if you do describe the reason instead of just the content, then yes, you could, you could use that. Um, but again, like, for may, this, go ahead. It may depend on the minimum digital accessibility standards mm -hmm. of your school. Mm -hmm. um, there are schools in Ohio that feel that if it's all being described within the text, they let it go. Um, our university disagrees with that. They feel that you need to explain something that the text is not saying about that picture. Um, I often try to ask people to pretend that they're on the phone with their grandma who can't see the picture and describe it that way. <laughs> yep. But you have to say the purpose or the action that's happening in your alt text. And we have a few slides on that coming up here too. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say what the answer in chat I gave was and similar to that is that the caption is telling you why it's here, or at least why you're using it in terms of your text. And I used to say that now I say the alt text is describing it as to what it is, just to say, like you said, describe what you're seeing on the page versus why you're including it in your text. So there's a lot of conversation to go around there. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, and there are, and uh, uh, there are, you know, um, options to just let, you know, let um, an automated alt text, you know, take place. And um, don't recommend that either, <laughs> you know, especially the more complex or the more information rich your, your image is. Um, so, um, and also if you have any writing, any text inside the image, you need to you know, so if it was a, uh, oh, what are those called? So Info we'll graphic. actually show that when we get to a slide. Yeah. If you have yeah. text on the image. Yeah. This is not a good alt text. I'm just going to tell you that right now, right? Three stick figures. Okay. 
I'm done. So that's not really good. Um, but one of the little tricky things is that, you know, a student may put in something like that, or they may allow it to be auto alt text and, and it will say underneath auto um, alt text auto generated um, and they'll just leave it be. Um, but that is something that the student has to do. You know, they're the ones that know the meaning. They're the ones that know the why. And so that is a heavier lift. <laughs> and Kim will be talking about that. So um, so you can see I put alt text in and now there's just one picture left, right? And if we go to no header row specified and we go to the table, okay, this would be the header row. I also want to comment just briefly on the idea of making tables um, hmm, readable, <laughs> even just, just to the naked eye, right? And so if I'm looking at this, it looks very cramped, cluttered. Everything is bolded. Um, you have, you know, things centered or um, not necessarily, like it's hard when we see numbers, for example, we can better appreciate the differences if they are right justified, right? It's easier because of how we read numbers, right? Um, whereas how we read text, now that doesn't look it's harder, it's harder for us to focus on, you know, the A, B, C, et cetera. So um, if something is centered and everything is consistently the same number of characters, that could be okay, right? That could be okay. But if if the information is, varies, right, in, in number of characters, then you're not going to want to center it. Because, I mean, look at this, right? If we center it. Ah, okay. And everything's everything's bold. And it's all in um, Times New Roman. Um, so when we talk about accessible, it's, it's more than just do we have a, a header row, you know, identified. Um, it is also just for the, just for the um, ability to easily read and comprehend the information, right? So think about how much better this looks if we just use Calibri, right? And if we pay attention to how we read, okay, I can see now AAA, right? It's, it's easier. Um, I can't tell how many zeros off we are. So... Now I can see anything that extends over, it's a larger number, right? So these are just like really minor things that aren't necessarily related to a, a technical aspect of accessibility per se, but they're easy to give guidance on. They're easy to teach. Um, and also Word and uh, has, you know, you can um, create tables. Um, and so we've had students trying to create their own tables by like putting boxes together, you know, like text boxes. I mean, it's, um, you'll, you'll find everything. <laughs> you'll find everything. So um, again, if I want to identify this as a header row, I just, I went to table tools design. And again, this may look slightly different depending on which version of Word you're using. And I just checked at a row. Okay. So, um, boom. Well, no, I shouldn't say boom. I should have to probably look at it again. Okay. Well, it's still showing. So that's just one of the weird quirks. I don't know what to tell you about that. So, let me stop share that. Now I'm going to share the 
PDF version of that. Well, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to go to. My other sample. OK, same document. It looks very similar, right? Just just to look at it. And, and a lot of, of a lot of students, a lot of people, actually, you know, they are trying to mimic the format or the look of, of, of an article or, you know, a book or whatever. And so, or even a template <laughs> that's out there. And so they're just, they're adjusting things. They're, you know, tabbing or they're entering spaces and to get it, to move it to where it needs to be. Look, we have page numbers in the actual footer. That's an actual page number. Oops. I was able to insert a table of contents because I used the styles and the headings. And so, so for example, I could update the table. Let's say I had changed something and I wanted just to update the page numbers only. I could do that. Everything's still the same. You notice how um, in the first version, everything was um, left, you know, left justified. Well, this goes a step further. Not only is it a heading level, but it's also indented so that you can easily and immediately see the hierarchy. Okay. So instead of using endless enter, 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 enter to push something, to push something to another page, just did a page break, okay? And you can insert a page break after every section, after every page if you need to, okay? Just like that, enter a page break, okay? Um, so we have a list of tables and figures, and this was tricky for me um, because the tool of inserting captions is not quite as um, intuitive as it looks. And there's a bit of kind of, you know, uh, changing the font style and color, etc. But once you get it where you need it, um, then you can create a list of tables and of figures. Okay. Now, um, section break. So a section break we use when we're changing our pagination or any other feature um, in the document structure from one to another. So this is all prefatory material, which at Utilito is paginated with lowercase Roman numerals. Um, but starting with chapter one, it's page one, okay? So if you don't have that section break, then it will just continue numbering you know, like this. So then we have our first chapter, which starts with page one and is numbered continuously thereafter. So we can use a page break after every chapter. Um, so that again ensures that, you know, everything starts on its on its own page. As you can see, let's open back to home, right? These are all headed appropriately. This was heading one. This was a heading two. This is a heading three. Um, when you have lists, you can also apply. And, and, and so there's other styles, like it's a caption. It's a list paragraph. Um, and so, you know, instead of just, listing things but still it's it's looked at as normal like a normal paragraph but you want to emphasize that what is following is a list well then you can designate it as a list paragraph you can use bullets um so these are just like things that will help once you convert it to a pdf um, to make it readable 
All right. So, and as you can, and if I run an accessibility check, no accessibility issues found. Okay. People with disabilities should not have difficulty reading this document. That being said, this accessibility checker isn't necessarily alerting you to things like color contrast or, um, you know, reading order. Um, and so there are still things that could not translate well once it's saved as a PDF. Um, and one of those I want to point out, let me turn off the formatting, sorry. Okay. One of the things I changed, right, was the look of the table. So not only does it have, you know, the header row identified, um, but I've also bolded the uh, column headings, and I've also put just a very minimal light shade behind it. Um, and again, I think structurally, it's it's easier to read, um, and it's it's you know there's plenty of white space. I mean, it's just it's just it's easy to look at <laughs> to read. Um, not to mention, obviously, you know, being um, with the document or with the um, table header row and other ish, other things um, defined. I also put a table or alt, you can put alt, alt text on tables or summaries as well. And I did that with this one. I went to table properties. This little thing popped up, right? So you can, you know, um, you can, uh, format, you know, the, the salt contents and, you know, um, you know, specify your height and width of rows and columns and, and all that, then there's alt text. So, um, this was taken from, um, disability dot, no, not disability.org. Um, it, it's through a, um, site through Cornell university. OK, and they provided the output of this um, database search um, in three different ways. So that's another thing to consider is, is there only one way to access this information? They presented a written summary. They also had a map of because this is, you know, this table is much longer. Obviously, it had all the states on it, um, but they presented it as a map that was interactive and they also presented it as a table. Um, and so um, again, I took their written description and used it as alt text or table summary. Um, and that is helpful, right? Um, because it's really talking about what you want to focus on. Like, what are you what, what is the point of putting all this data? What do you want the reader to take from that? And using an alt text or a table summary can help. Um, so, okay. Um, small things like, like hyperlinks, okay? So we have at Utilito, you know, all text must be in black or automatic. Um, and links, hyperlinks uh, should not be in color. They should be in black. Well, if you do that and you don't underline it, nobody's going to know necessarily that it's a link. So, you know, one of the things you can do, and it's a, again, it's a small lift, is just make sure that all links are underlined. Um, they are helpful also for people, especially if it's in color, okay? Um, because it's underlined, it's a cue for someone who may have low vision that that is a link, you know? So um, again, I, I my goal with this was to hopefully share some takeaways. You know, if you could take one thing back to your school that you can start using or use better um, or pay attention to, um, 
you know, using, you know, the software and, and so forth, the tools that are available to you, then this will be a success. Um, so I am going to close out of this. I'm sorry. I keep moving my stop share button. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, okay, back to the workshop. All right, so that was my spiel about Word. Um, I hope people have been commenting or there's questions. Um, I, I'd like to make sure that Kim has enough time to do the heavier lift <laughs> with the PDF, um, but just keep them coming. Um, so we move on now to reviewed, right? So my part was more on how can we design to, you know, remediate in advance, right? To prevent the need for excessive remediation. How do we check, find, and fix non-accessible components of an ETD? So, you know, Kim is going to take over and talk about, you know, what most of our schools are using as the final document format, um, how to use an accessibility checker, what you can and can't do. And so, <laughs> I am not calling Kim a house elf, okay? Um, but <laughs> I yes, I went on to corny Adobe jokes, and there is an actual site for that. So I was I was very gratified. Um, so Kim, I don't know if you want to kind of take it over from here and then share the the PDFs that I sent you. Yes. Sure. Okay. You need to stop sharing. Sorry. uh yes okay um i just didn't know if you wanted to oh you already have this as well okay yes sure. <laughs> okay because i sent it in the timely fashion of like 8 39 so <laughs> stop share no i actually i think it was 9 39 all right yes. stop share there we go and i will mute myself and let our expert house elf take over <laughs> Okay, so um, does everyone see the refined screen? Great. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the technology, the training and the teamwork involved in making one of these documents accessible. One of the first things that I wanted to go over is just talking about alt text and how alt text works. I uh, have taken this information from the Social Security Administration's handbook and have found it very helpful when I'm teaching students about making their thesis or dissertation accessible. So here is a picture, obviously a figure, and the text below it would be like what it says in your document. But giving you a moment to read that, I'll go on to the next slide to talk about what the alt text should be. Okay, so in this case, the alt text should be Pastel leading her handler who holds the harness in his left hand. And the reason that guide dog and man really isn't the best alt text is um, this picture uh, displays an action with the dog guiding the human. Um, the second choice provides a very static description and therefore the first choice would be the best example for alternate text. Here I'm showing a bar graph that you can look over for a moment. And then we'll talk about the alt text for this bar graph. Okay, so the first one is the best alt text because first off it starts off and says bar chart. 
uh, more than likely in the information that's in the document about this particular figure, someone isn't going to say this is a bar chart about blah, 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 or this is a scatter plot, or this is a line graph, right, a pie graph. So the first thing you want to say is the type of chart that it is, or graph that it is. And then you want to go into figures for head pats. Here scratches and kisses climb steadily during the week. From a few on Monday to around five or six on Thursday, there's a rapid decline comparable to Monday's and Friday's levels. So it is explaining the trend in the chart that it goes up here and then it drops quickly. The second choice um, doesn't tell us the trend or the main purpose of the chart. The third choice doesn't tell you anything. It just says chart. Uh, the fourth choice gives data but the purpose of a chart is not to display data. It is to convey the meaning found in the data. Tables are just for displaying data. So I'll say that again. The purpose of this bar chart is not to display the data. It is to convey the meaning found in the data. Okay. And then the fifth choice gives additional information that's not actually shown in this chart. Um, it's talking about a total of 32 weeks and goes on a little further. And that information is not here. Notice these numbers going up to 17. I only go up to eight on the chart. <laughs> so you don't want to give more than what's already there. My next example here, this is a picture that has words on top of the picture. The screen reader cannot read these words. Okay, it just knows there's a figure. So first off, a good rule to follow on alternate text is about 160 characters. So it's a few sentences. And secondly, you're gonna wanna quote in this particular case, what the words say in the picture. So the good alt text says, Pastel is looking up attentively. So it lets you see the action of what the dog is doing or hear the action of what the dog is doing and it quote unquote says this is me pretending to be interested and then she yawns that's the dog by the way pastel and this is me not pretending okay um the second choice the second choice here omits the humor of the yawn um even though it's talking about the text and the third choice here while it tells you about looking up in the yawn, it is not verbatim. And if you have words on top of a picture like that, you need to quote it verbatim, what it says. Also here in this example, I should say, I used pictures for the uh, bullets and that's a huge no-no because then you've got to start explaining each bullet, green check mark, red X and Y. You don't want to have to do that. If you have your students use Microsoft Word, the bullets that are involved in Word um, are automatically set to be accessible, even when they come to a PDF. And if you do have some reason that you personally are doing something like I am today, where you're going to have bullet points, you can say bullet for the alt text. But it's uh, also, here in this picture is Pastel's signature. And so many of us have Aya Cook or IRB letters, and maybe there's a signature involved in our PDF. You don't have to say what the signature is. You just say signature for the alt text. Okay. And then uh, if you have logos, so we have the BGSU logo, for example, that's on an Aya Cook letter or an IRB letter. Um, if you have logos involved in your PDF, you just have to say logo for the alt text. Um, if you choose to say BGSU logo or, you know, University of Florida logo or wherever you're at, that's your choice, but you're going to be repeating that over and over. And what is required is to say signature for signatures and logo for logos. Another example I wanted to give you is about equations. Now, if a screen reader, when an equation is made in Word, um, if the screen reader can read it like regular text in its text paragraph when it's tagged, and I'll show you that in a minute from PDF version, what I mean, then you don't need alt text. If they are including it um, as a picture, 
<laughs> in the document their equation. Uh, maybe they couldn't get Word to do what they needed with the superscripts and the subscripts and whatever else was going on in that equation, and they insert it as a picture, you definitely need to give it full alt text. The choice up above is a very obvious thing. It's the Pythagorean theorem. So you, because it's a known equation, you could just say Pythagorean theorem as your alt text. But you could also have the a squared. Notice that squared is spelled out. The plus sign is spelled out. B squared equals is spelled out C squared so that your screen reader reads it across if needed. I gave another one with the FOIL method here, um, an alternate description for this. I wanted to use this because it's the number two, but it's open parentheses. So you have to, can't just say parentheses. You have to open the parentheses. You have to close the parentheses. So two open parentheses for a Y plus spelled out one close parentheses equals 3y in this particular case. Now, I don't want those of you who are using LaTeX to, to freak out about the constant equations you're going to see, because generally those equations can be read by the text editor when it comes into PDF. However, there are certain characters that just don't work. Adobe doesn't work and play well with other programs. I am sorry to tell you, they just don't. <laughs> uh, so sometimes that plus or minus sign, it just cannot read that character. Um, and there are some other examples that I can try to come up with. So I'm going to share some PDFs here. Um, so this is a PDF that Terry was working with in Word. And I thought I would take you through the steps if you have full Acrobat. So Reader doesn't allow you to do this. You do need access to full Acrobat to run an accessibility checker. You um, may not have the accessibility checker set up like I do as one of the common tools that I use. So I'm gonna show you how to get to the tools. Up here in the top, whether you're on a Mac or PC, you have this home and tools. You can go to tools and you need to scroll down to accessibility. Click on that and you'll have a new menu on the right. You wanna click the accessibility check. There's a check mark next to it and you should get this pop-up for accessibility checker options. Now, depending on the minimum digital accessibility standards at your school for what you would have flagged here. Our school flags them all. So I'm going to go with that. Tell it to start checking. And over here on the left, it pops up. The problems are bolded. If you click the little carrot that's on the left, you can get a drop down under each section for what might be an issue. And this particular document, the logical reading order, has a question mark. It is required that you fix things with the red X. It is strongly recommended to fix things with the blue question mark. But again, minimum digital accessibility standards at your school can determine whether or not you need to do this. Okay. You can, if you're mildly... OCD like me, <laughs> tell it that it passed. If you're trying to get it off the screen, um, the color contrast again is something you would manually check and isn't gonna run through it for you. However, with this title that failed, you can right click and tell it to fix if the title is in the document properties but you can see that it's not. What am I referring to? If you go up to File and Properties, you'll see, and we at BGSU require our students to fill in their title, their subject, and a minimum of three keywords. Um, so the title here is Establishing Digital. And we have 
Terry's name here and the subject we'll say is something that's brief um, and to the point. I mean, it can be multiple words, but the point in the keywords is making it so that somebody can Google for your document. It's like tagging your document. Um, the subject wouldn't necessarily be repeated in the keywords. So I'm saying technology. The example I always use when I'm teaching this to our grad students is I'll, I usually do something, I play trumpet. And so I talk about my great dissertation about Louis Armstrong's trumpet playing style. And so when I get to the subject, I could say that the subject is music. That's pretty broad. I could get a little more detailed and say jazz music and that would help rein in my subject a bit. Um, trumpet playing style is really what I'm talking about, but then again, I'm probably going to be using trumpet and other things in the keywords, which is going to make it a searchable document. Um, I'm hoping that that is making sense for everyone here. So Notice that I'm using a semicolon in between the keywords. Um, a semicolon reads as a hard break for HTML coding. So you don't use commas. Commas are like a run on. You do use semicolons. If you wanted to use something like I'm, I teach in business and we talk about a SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, you could use the abbreviation and then explain it. So once that's filled in, now when I tell it to fix it, it automatically fixes it because it can find that title. The next example it's talking about is an alternate text issue for figures. If I click on this, I can tell it to fix and it will take me to the first image. Now, this is something you should be showing your students how to do because they're the best person to describe the alternate text of your figure. Um, And then you would just keep going with explaining it. Represents, you know, and you could say they have a hat on or whatever you need to do to get it ex described, but that's cataracts. And then I would say the one on the right is a distracted driver and shows a person um, in front of a steering wheel. Kim, there was a question in chat. I'm not sure if Terry meant it for everyone or to ask you directly. Uh, but Sorry. the question was, uh, if the PDF is full text searchable, why would you put it in, put in keywords? Um, because this is what allows the document to be searched by Google or in um, wherever your repository is. Um, it's like the main terms if i'm looking for somebody's thesis about um uh, photochemical sciences if i put in the term photochemical sciences hopefully it'll come up it makes it it makes it searchable makes it discoverable while google Col scholar may have crawled the document it's not necessarily pulling that I don't know if I'm explaining that real well here. <laughs> In our school, we require it. <laughs> How's that? Um, it, it makes the document more discoverable, easier to find. So uh, we gave alt text on this particular figure and I hit the arrow and now I have alt text for the next figure. And you would go through the same thing to describe and type in the alt text 
and it would keep going if there were more images. And when you're done, you say save and close and it auto fixes it for you. Now, of course, on that second one, I didn't give the best alt text. I mean, let's be real. If I, I just type something in quickly. So if I click on over here on the right, the reading order, I get a new pop up that allows me to get in here and view different, hopefully, it's tagged correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's going to argue with me because it says text paragraph. Let me save the document and then maybe it should work. And this is the kind of thing I deal with every day. Here we go. Edit alternate text. So I had to save it. And you can see here what they've typed. When you scroll through it, if I even close this, I can hover over it to see what they've typed. But the problem is, is that is not good, legit alternate text. Does everybody agree? <laughs> so you can see when something is auto-generated. And while it may pass, it's probably not the rest, the best alt text necessarily. And it's good to check for this to see if they just did auto generated. I've seen things that's like a, a, a picture of a bunch of balloons going up in the air and it said it was a fruit basket. <laughs> and that's because Word did auto generated text. Um, so make sure your students are describing their objects. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt. No. Um, I I just wanted to um, uh, let you know that the the PDF that you have opened right now was based on my the first word that was yes. completely unformed. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. I'm but I'll show you the next to... one soon. <laughs> Good. Okay. I'm curious to see what actually made it through versus what's still being a thorn in our sides. <laughs> And something else that I should explain is that if you have to auto tag a document, um, and if we have enough time, I, I'll share some other documents so they can show you what I mean by auto tagging. If you have to auto tag a document, everything that someone has done in Word is going to go away. So if you auto tag a document, you lose all the alt text for the figures, all the table summaries, things like that. Um, ask your students to keep both the original Word or original LaTeX and original PDF. And now the LaTeX and over, we use Overleaf and, and it outputs as a PDF for our students. So they have to do all their work from PDF in the first place if they've started in LaTeX. Um, but keeping a list of those alternate texts so they can just copy and paste them back in is super important. We'll also tell you, um, especially because I know Larry does a lot of LaTeX here. <laughs> um, if you auto tag a LaTeX document um, and it has several equations, often it can add these gigantic parentheses in the equation in a place that it doesn't belong, like through the middle of a number. Um, and there's no way to just use the edit tool and get it out. So you don't always want to, you, you know, have them, if they auto tag it and it causes more problems, make sure they have a previous version saved so that they don't turn in the one that's worse. Sometimes auto tagging fixes things, sometimes it doesn't. So it's kind of a crapshoot. And again, if we have some time at the end, I'll try to show some other examples of what I'm talking about and how it can make things worse. And just as a point of note for that as well, there's about 15 minutes left in the, the time period. So just make, if you have Thank time you. for questions, what you need. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to go over tables quickly. Um, over here, it's telling me we have table error and we're going to click on the element and bring up the reading order. So it says the table header failed. If I right click in here, and go to the table header. I can click on each individual cell and change the cell properties. So here I am making this a header cell. And I have to click on each one to fix that. Everything that is pink is a header cell. Everything that is gray is a data cell. So I don't have to go in and fix these because it auto fixed them as I was changing it across the top. 
the next thing it's telling me that's a problem is the summary. I go back to here and say edit table summary. A table summary, um, fortunately, the screen reader will read everything that's in this table. So all we're trying to do is set up the framework of the table so that someone who's listening can understand what's going to happen here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five columns, one, two, three, four, five rows, pretty easy. So we're going to tell it five columns, five rows, including the header row. Now, if you choose to add other information about this table here, like say it's a large table and you have a consistent recurring number or you want to talk about the mean or the median or something else, that's fine. But the absolute bare minimum in a table summary is how many columns and how many rows because the screen reader is going to go across and read each one. And the person will be able to picture this table in their head from that basic framework that you've told them for the table. If a table is on multiple pages, please have your students remember to repeat the header row on each page. And it will make them say how many rows and how many columns for that table on the page. So they can say table continued, how many rows, how many columns, including the header row again. And Quickly, I wanted to share another version that Terry shared with me of this document. This is the version that she had made accessible in Word. So again, I'm going to go to Tools and Accessibility and tell it to start that check. Kim, not to interrupt too much, but we had a question in the chat. It might be in interesting to this point that can you change justification in the table like was that was done in Word in Adobe, I suppose? Um, it, you can use the edit tool to do a lot of that, yes. Um, I can show you because it's going to take me back down to that table. So uh, Terry, what I just wanted to tell you is except for the alternate text coming through, notice that the title still failed because it's not in the properties. Well, it is, so you can fix it. <laughs> um, the table header says it still failed. And so while it says that, it thinks everything's a header cell for some reason. So I would have to go back through and do all of these cells. hit the wrong thing, sorry. And I know that I don't want to waste your time and show you that I'm doing this over and over again, but just to say that you would need to do this on every single cell coming across and make them gray before this is going to go away. It also says the summary failed. So we'd again have to tell it five columns, five rows, um, including the header row in this case. So the one thing that came through on her version was the alternate text consistently stayed. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions and if people want to stay after, I'm happy to share some other examples here of things that you might be seeing. So I have some other PDFs prepared. If people want to stay on a little longer, I'm happy to try to do that, but I'm not sure if somebody else is at noon. So um, anybody have any questions? There was a question from earlier that I wasn't sure who it was directed to, if it was somebody in chat or to the presenters, um, but it was, um, where was it now? Do you teach your students to modify styles or do you provide templates with pre-formatted styles? So in our particular case, um, we have our first level headings are done a certain way and we have that set in our template um, because certain colleges may follow APA and other colleges here may follow MLA or Chicago. We also get ACS, ASA, and then we just get people that are 
kind of combining things and not really following a style guide. So we look for consistency. Are all the second levels done the same? Are all the thirds done the same? That kind of thing. But we set our first level headings. There are in all capital letters, they're centered and it is their choice if they bold them, but we show them how to set that in the screen and word. I wanted to return back to the um, presentation. Uh, I think we're gonna skip over a couple of the last slides in order to give um, Allison her wrap up time as well. But um, as, as Kim stated, I am also more than happy to stay on and answer questions and dig into things. We do have an hour break that's already been scheduled. So, um, you know, if, if you're able to, and you want to, um, I'd love to hang out with you all. <laughs> so let me just return back to the presentation. If I can find it. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So we kind of, I think we leapfrogged over a couple things, but that's okay. Um, and I think something that we also already know from our various, you know, um, focus groups and things like that is that um, Adobe is really, it's very challenging to use for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is its inaccessibility to students because of cost, uh, availability, um, you know, et cetera. So um, a lot of the checking and guiding and doing that work on the on the back side of things does fall on the ETD practitioner, which, as someone noted in the uh, in the chat, is just extremely time consuming. Um, so, um, so really, you know, when we're talking about refining, um, you know, we need to think about. Where do we go from here? So I'm going to, let's think about technology. What's new? What's obsolete, right? You can't, you can't play a beta max tape on a CD player. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, does it have backwards compatibility? I'm using one version, you know, of, of, of Microsoft Word and then there's newer stuff and, you know, uh, things are, not necessarily in the same places and it can take longer. Um, are you an early adopter, right? Do you have your eye on the horizon to see what's coming? Um, training, right? I recommend go straight to the source, right? If you need to know about how to work with, with Microsoft Word, go to, oh, I forgot to put Word in there. <laughs> go to Microsoft, um, go to Adobe, go to the government. Um, they're, um, their tutorials and information are surprisingly accessible, <laughs> readable. Um, it kind of gives me a little bit of hope. <laughs> so, but also avail yourself. If your institution offers LinkedIn Learning, they have wonderful, you know, training modules. Um, your school's IT, maybe the Office of Disability. If you have an online learning division, um, center for teaching. So explore these other campus partners who may be already working on a similar issue um, and see if you can't join forces and um, everybody benefit from one another. Um, and I'll conclude by talking about teamwork, right? So I think first and foremost, we have the USETDA has user groups now for formatting, for community engagement, um, and there are state and library consortiums. Um, there are designer groups. Um, there's user experience testing. Um, there are also third-party vendors um, and also who can provide solutions. Um, workshops, conferences in your professional organizations. Um, again, this is gaining speed. So, you know, um, everybody is, every, it's everybody's job. And so you may not always get invited, so invite yourself to the to the table. So um, I will see here. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and then let um, Allison go ahead and share the remainder of her her screen or her slides. Awesome. Thank you. I've just got a couple and I will try to be brief because I do want to at least 
be cognizant of a couple of questions, but like others said, um, I am available as well to hang out after if there is any interest. So um, can somebody confirm you can see my screen? Awesome. So we talked a lot about at the beginning about kind of defining this problem, what's happening in the marketplace, what are institutions doing um, with this challenge around providing the most accessible content as possible. And uh, at ProQuest, we, we really want to partner. We want to be able to provide support and resources um, similar to what you've been given here in this workshop. We, we want to um, provide you with the tools you need to do this work that you, know, you needed to be doing yesterday, right? Um, and so the first, the first step in understanding what, what we should consider looking forward, how we can provide resources and solutions um, is, is talking to you all. So partnering with uh, some thought leaders, some, some people that are doing great work on, on the forefront um, of this initiative. Uh, some of the people on this call are, are part of this community. So we had 12 individual participants uh, cross-functionally, so library, graduate studies, with experience in various facets of digital accessibility, from, from doing the work at a really detailed level to implementing student-led kind of policy change and rollout. So a lot of different views from 11 institutions, uh, diverse in institutional type, geographic region, and um, student population size. We have so far met three times, had really, really great working sessions, really robust conversations to establish some best practices and sort of um, find a North Star, determine where we, we want to go. Um, and we've established a quarterly meeting cadence to continue the discussion as um, things change and, and the topic of accessibility advances. Um, but we did come up with a sort of a best practices document. So some, some standards that are really, really detailed, right? So what, what, where do we wanna go? As Terry said, there's never gonna be a 100% accessible document. Um, but what can we kind of run through as a checklist and say, okay, if a document has these features and, and their quality features, um, you know, that we're doing pretty good. Um, so, so establishing that sort of standard. And then looking ahead. So where do we want to offer a solution? Where can we be of service? Um, as we've talked about on this call, accessibility should be happening throughout the ETD process, right? Prior to writing your student education, there's templating during the writing process. Um, but what we're considering at the moment is um, ProQuest being able to, to be of service at this point, sort of to the right of this dashed line, right? So future consideration includes integrating an accessibility checker in ETD admin. Um, our submission tool. So something that's part of an existing workflow for an administrator, um, a tool that's easy to use that, that can inform and really help simplify and expedite this work. Um, and to hear more about that, uh, we do have a session uh, tomorrow afternoon with a roadmap review. So if you wanna learn more about that feature and others, um, I'd encourage you to attend. Um, and and post-submission, right? We, accessibility is a, reg a relatively new thing. And we're sitting on these, these large back files of PDFs where accessibility wasn't even a consideration. And so right now, a service that we do offer, a paid service is that we do um, remediate back file for institutions. So we're approached by institutions that want their, their back file remediated, and we, we can do that on a project basis. So again, if that's something that there's an appetite for at your institution, happy to talk more about that. And finally, I just want you all to, I want to invite you to join the conversation. We are always learning at ProQuest. There's always um, uh, more to hear about. And if you're thinking about best practices, where to start implementation at your institution, I would love to chat with you about that. Likewise, um, if you would like to help inform future solutions, if you have thoughts about this accessibility checker, or you think, I know what ProQuest could do that would really, really help us. Those are discussions I, I would welcome um, and I'd love to hear from you. So I do have my contact information included here. Um, I believe it's in Terry's deck that was sent out as well. And so I will wrap up. I'm sorry, we have like a minute for questions, but thank you so much. 
Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and again, if you have to get going here at noon, we are going to stick around for a little bit to answer any other extra questions we have, but this will be recorded and shared. Um, but it's a wonderful presentation. Um, so thank you. Uh, I guess going back really quickly, there's one question I saw that somebody asked, uh, Megan asked in chat. When you're doing a format check for a student, are you only running the checker or are, there, are you reading the alt text submissions to make sure it doesn't say chart? And as a secondary part to that, I had a question earlier about has anybody who's instituted some of, or implemented these these sort of uh, accessibility checks and processes and changes to that to have you've done a turnaround time sort of uh, analysis to say how much has the process increased in time uh, or how much more labor have you had to put forth comparing to what it was prior to having accessibility integrated into your checks? In our particular case, um, with adding the accessibility checks, I would say. Um, we don't read our theses and dissertations word for word. We check the headings to make sure they're spelled correctly and that they match the page numbers and so forth and tables and figure headings and their page numbers. Um, we do scroll through the entire document to check other requirements that we have. I would say a 200 page dissertation that includes figures, tables, um, schemes, equations, yada, yada. That's at least, at least three hours. And then that's us listing everything wrong with it, not just accessibility, writing up a letter, sending it back to the student and putting it back on the student to fix it. Um, we've created uh, tutorial and videos and have workshops multiple times each semester to try to help our students learn how to do this. Uh, there are, of course, the students who don't bother to check any of that or do any of that. And of course, they're in that one and done situation, right? I submitted, boom, I'm good. And they didn't realize the rest of this was required. So we are now really pushing with our vice provost and dean of the graduate college how our grad coordinators and our committee chairs really need to know this is how it's done and this is what they need to do. Um, too many faculty are currently saying, this is how I had to do it. Yeah, but they went to a totally different institution and that was 20 years ago. So <laughs> it's a whole other ball game now. And uh, so, yeah. There's some other questions there for you, I guess. Uh, how many ETDs on average do you uh, review each semester? And um, do you also charge a fee for dissertation support or in general? We do not charge a fee. I have myself and um, a a 10 hour grad assistant and a 20 hour grad assistant that helped me with this work. Um, at, at U Toledo, um, <laughs> we, we <laughs> Kim's laughing because we're on our like fifth interim acting dean in as little as three years. But anyway, I digress. So, um, but our, our numbers have gone down just slightly, just, you know, loss of enrollment and so forth. But on average, about 100 to 120 get reviewed every semester not that's not all that upload but they're going to definitely take our time you know when they are clearly not ready to graduate but that's another whole story um and um we don't of course charge a fee it is now again a party of one a shop of one <laughs> because i had a 20 hour week ga um and our, our last budget cuts took everything away. So um, I'm trying to figure out how to enact the roles of my, or enact the responsibilities of my position and, and enact a new, you know, help shepherd in a new policy and then educate everyone. So, and that's, that's a, that's a, almost a heavier lift is educating the people surrounding the student right, you know, um, who are guiding them through the writing, you know, it would be wonderful if faculty would take that role on, you know, and, and help, at least help in the design and writing, you know, of it initially, um, and pay attention to those issues. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> so... I was going to say, oh, okay. we got a question. I'll read that before I say anything. Um, I'm curious about institutional repository submissions and checking documents at that stage. We're a small undergrad college. 
or thesis capstones are done. Oh, chat, don't scroll on me. Are done by most students. <laughs> I'm thinking I need a help pay, libguide page on this topic or, or to at least get the information out there. Any suggestions on what to include? Uh, well, wow, good question. I'm happy to share our website in the chat. I'm sure if other people have yeah. websites that are pretty robust, they'll yeah, share I, them too. I shared Pitts as well. I mean, I, again, probably looking for different programs and see if they do provide that support information um, in trying to assess what might work for your particular needs. Because um, again, it could be scaled up to a certain level or down depending on what you what you can facilitate. That's a hard thing to to um, to give a one 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 answer covers everything um, because it, it depends on what you're working with. And I have to say that working, uh, we do about 600 to 700. Um, uh, it's a decentralized process, but a PIP does about that many per year. Um, and I've seen students get pushback from their uh, defense committees and their, their advisors to not use templates uh, early on because, or they don't like what the template's doing per se, and it causes a this, this sort of rush at the end to get everything formatted and a headache for the students who are told by one, one party at the institution, do it this way, and then another do it this way, um, and trying to figure out where it's the middle ground there to say, we need this for this reason. What can we do to make this easier? Uh, and sometimes that's a hard conversation to have if you have many, many different schools and colleges in, in, in your university um, and many different disciplines. Because again, engineering is totally different than music and it's totally different than medicine. It's totally different than what have you. Um, so it, it can be difficult to have that. But setting some standards and giving tutorials and giving guides uh, will help alleviate some of that pain from my experience as well. And I think um, I just want to add on to that because um, I've seen some questions about, you know, what, what like, is it the grad school that does this, is the library that does this, is regardless of who is it's being centralized with, is to tap into your campus partners because they're probably still doing that similar work. Um, they probably have more credibility than your grad school, you know, or your library or your particular department does. And so if as a larger unit, like an office of accessibility or diversity or, you know, if they're doing that work, you know, you can gain momentum and credibility, um, you know, to take it where it needs to go. Um, and I'm putting in a shameless plug for our 2 p.m. Uh, session on the local implementation for Ohio Link, because we will be talking a lot about what has this process, how has it evolved, what does it look like at our individual schools, um, and it's still not necessarily representative of all schools or anything like that. Um, but one thing, uh, someone was asking about an undergrad institution small and so you know you may want to reach out to Oberlin College um, in Ohio um, their um, minimum accessibility standards document is one that Utilito is modeling even though they're undergrad they just have it you know well written and fleshed out and so I I would say you know um we're lucky. We're very lucky in Ohio. I'll just say that. <laughs> We're very, very lucky that we have this consortial environment. Um, but it also changes. For example, we no longer put anything on an institutional repository. It lives in Ohio Link, you know, but other schools may do both. Um, some schools may just use ProQuest, right, and go directly through their administrator. Whereas in Ohio, ProQuest harvests our stuff. So it's just, it is, it's really complex and it, and it varies. And, and I think a takeaway is to find your partners, <laughs> find your partners in crime, stick to the very basics, you know, ensure that you're looking at it through compliance and usability, you know, to kind of get a grasp on it. Um, and remember, it all goes back to people right? How do you educate them? How do you motivate them? How do you bring them along? You know, um, and so that can probably help inform individual practices, I think, at each institution based on your own structure and who's doing what and who you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah.
Um, John, was there any other kind of questions or anything that you think people wanted to have answered? Just trying to say, I know I saw somebody uh, give a comment about the higher proofreaders. Uh, Kathy and chat said that to do that, but then they asked if they could maybe do the accessibility review process. I would say that's probably not going to be feasible for the proofreaders because that's a different skill set for the most part. They're looking more about the the context or the, the content, if you will, rather than the formatting and accessibility. So it would be a, a different hire. Uh, if you're if you're doing a third party for that, so that might be interesting. And uh, somebody asked me if we're still using ePrints. <laughs> we're shifting to uh, Haiku for Consortia um, quite soon. But yeah. Other than that, I'm just trying to scroll back. There's a lot of talk that happened all at once there. Um, does anyone have the grad schools doing formatting or accessibility reviews? Um, I think again, as you, as Terry was just saying, that it, it's it could be different depending on what institution you're at, what you do, how, what your solution is. Uh, as I've said, Pitt does a decentralized, where each grad school has a representative that does the formatting for that, and then they submit it to the IR, and then I approve or help with that to make sure everything's going on there. Um, but it could just be one office, it could be uh, uh, something outside of the graduate schools, it could be the library, um, or what have you. So it's everybody's different. <laughs> And you might be surprised your IT department at your school definitely should be a good resource about accessibility. They're already doing it for any of the web work that they're doing. So they're definitely going to have some things that they can recommend to you. Well, thank you all for, yeah, for, for the wonderful workshop. Um, seems like the questions are starting to die down. So um, if there's any past this uh, workshop, uh, feel free to email any of us and we can try and share it with the group as best we can <laughs> and uh, go from there. But and I, and I also want to emphasize that, you know, um, in addition to this chat, um, there are also, you know, certain websites and resources that we're assembling that will be added to the presentation in the conference proceedings. Um, we weren't, I, I shouldn't say we. I was not fully prepared <laughs> to, you know, and there wouldn't have really been time anyway. So um, my goal is to add to the current takeaways and at least provide soft places for people to land on their journey, <laughs> you know. Um, and again, thank you everybody for for your time this morning. I know for some of you, it's quite early still. Um, I haven't even finished my coffee. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Um, so... Um, yeah, so enjoy the break and I guess, um, you know, feel free. Uh, our information is going to be made available. Um, so I, I think the list of conference attendees was sent out earlier. So again, I'm Terry Green. We have Kim Fleshman and Allison Thompson. And so our, in, our contact information should be there. Please do not hesitate. I'll speak for me. Do not hesitate to reach out um, and you know, ask me questions and I'm open to suggestions for improvement too. <laughs> so yeah. So thank you everybody. And thank you, Kim and Allison so much and John for being an awesome moderator. <laughs> thank you everybody. Thanks guys. All right. Have a good day. See you in the next session. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>